Apostles have been saying, we've been studying Grace 101, Grace 201, Grace 301. Grace as God's riches and at Christ's expense. It's a misprint in the bulletin. It should have been God's riches at Christ's expense. That's 101. That's the basic issue of justification. The righteousness of God is ours in Christ Jesus. And everything God, He made a complete work in me at Calvary. And when he put me in, he's just like putting that skittle in that little bottle in the water, and it dissolves into the water and colors the water. You've got a complete identification of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that's his becomes yours, and everything that's yours becomes his, by the way. That's kind of an interesting thought about that all of a sudden, isn't it? God's riches at Christ's expense. Not what I did is what he did. It's not what I surrender is what he surrendered. It's not what I accomplish, it's what He accomplished. And as you've received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk you in Him. He doesn't change the deal once you get saved. He doesn't treat saved people in, in, in a lesser capacity than He treats lost people. He forgives lost people all their sins and saved people have all their sins forgiven. Whoopee! Total, complete, absolute forgiveness. He doesn't, he doesn't tell a lost man, here, I'll forgive your sins if you'll trust me. And then when you get saved, he says, unless you confess your sins, I'll knock you in the head for it. And all that short account system that we all grew up under and so forth. He's put all that away. 101, that's basic. Then you grow into where Tom had us last night in chapter Romans 6 in, into grace rightly applied changes everything in life. That's sort of the I'm in Him, and everything that is His is mine. And now I realize that that also means everything that's mine is His. And that really changes your perspective about everything. Tonight we're going to talk about the, the, the next lap. And i trying to figure out a way to do the G-R-A-C-E, and I just came up with the glorious revelation at Christ's exaltation. <laughs> Because that's, that's, what the, that's where Tom left us last night. Romans chapter 8, verse 18, when, 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 he, when, when the, Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present world are not compared to, be, to the glory which shall be revealed in us. You understand, folks, there is a glory that shall be revealed. Where? In us. It's not just that it's going to be revealed, but if the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ you and I are going to be integral participants of that as members of the church, the body of Christ. That glory is going to be revealed in and thus through us. Now that's what Ephesians 2 is talking about. Now Ephesians builds on Romans. You know the, the, the edification structure as you go through the book of uh, uh, Paul's epistles. Romans lays down the foundation of grace and then Ephesians orients you to the, the goal of what grace is about. Romans tells you here, you're equipped by the cross work of Christ to live as a member of the church, the body of Christ on planet earth for God's glory. You've got every bit of the equipping you'll ever need. Romans starts out by diagnosing your problem. You're lost. <laughs> You're condemned. Brother said this morning, what's the problem lost? Man, he's dead. Tell a, guy to, you know, tell a guy to turn from his sins is like walking up to the casket and telling a dude to turn over. His problem isn't that he's misdirected, uneducated, malnourished. His problem is he's dead. Okay? And then he says, here's the deliverance. There's justification. Declared righteous, given God's life. God's justice will give eternal life to anybody that has perfect righteousness, and you get that perfect righteousness in his son. God made him to be sin for us that knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What a wonderful thing that is. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Then he gives you his life. You're dead with him, you're alive with him. Then he tells you, by the way, you're not Israel. Don't go stealing Israel's program and, pro and prophecies and promises because I ain't through with Israel. I'm going to do what I told him I'm going to do. You're something different, Romans 9, 10, and 11. Then he says, look, let me show you what that life looks like in life. And by the time you get to the end of Romans... You've, you, you've, you've gotten that foundation laid of, of orientation to God's grace and you know exactly who you are and how you can function as a member of the body of Christ and the details of your life and you can have His life functioning, living in you. Then you come to Ephesians and He says, by the way, 
The reason he did all that stuff back there is he's got something really big that he's made you a part of. And I want you to see the goal that God has in mind. I've said it a thousand times to people. Your salvation for you and me is great just to get out of hell. <laughs> I've always, the day I got saved, getting out of hell was the, was the issue. I didn't get saved for the good of mankind, the glory of God, or, or, or satisfying mom, anybody else. I knew I was going to die and go to hell, bust hell wide open, fry like a sausage, burn like a torch. I knew I was on the way, and there wasn't anything I could do about it. And when I heard that Jesus Christ took care of the deal, paid my sin debt, and would offer me life if I'd trust him, that was the deal I took. And I didn't take it for any of the glory of God. I took it just because I'd, I, I'd rather be hell scared than hell scorched. Amen. And I trusted him for that reason. But then I began to study and I found out, you know, there's more to this than that. And when you get over to Ephesians, you find out that you getting saved from hell is sort of like a small number three footnote at the bottom of the page. There's a whole bunch of big stuff up top. And that's what Ephesians takes you to. When you come to Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 4, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love when he hath loved us, even when he, we were dead in, in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Notice how he says that in verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. Now, you notice Paul doesn't say anything about your being, your being crucified with Christ, being buried with Christ, or even being raised with Christ. Why would he leave that out? Because he expects in the people that read, are reading Ephesians to already know that because they've studied what? Romans. Romans. Ephesians over and over is written in a way that demonstrates Paul is expecting you to understand Ephesians based upon the fact that you've already got your feet grounded in Romans. You're, you died with him, you're buried with him, you're raised to walk in newness of life, and now Ephesians says, okay, now beyond that, we're going to go up into the heavens with him. We're quickened together with him. He picks up the resurrection life. And then he says, not only are you quick, and by the way, then he says, he, see, he puts that little princess in there, by grace are you saved. I used to wonder, why would he put that in there? And I, I can't, it dawned on me when I realized it, that, you know, he, he leaves out the stuff in Romans and just assumes you know it. I think he put that little princess to remind you, hey, by the way, don't forget that stuff back in Romans. <laughs> and then he says in verse 6, he's raised us up. That is, we ascended up into heaven with him. I started to put the chalkboard up, but then I realized that half the room couldn't see it, so I'm, I'm trying to do all this visually. He raised you up. We, we, you're, you're seated, you're, you're, you ascended up with him into heaven, and then you're seated together with him in heavenly places. Now, there's a lot of hokey stuff goes about that verse, being seated together with him. People say, well, you know, he's up there, and... We're down here, and we're down here, and we're up there. And you're not in two places at once. You're down here. When he says you're seated together with him, he's talking about you are a participant in his authority in the government of the heavens. That's what his being seated in heaven is about. You go back in chapter 1, and you read it. And you study, by the time you've got to chapter 2 in Ephesians, you've been through chapter 1 because chapter 1 comes before chapter 2. And you've read in verse 19, 20, 21 about, those, about him being seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all principality and power. He's been made the head of all the government of all the universe in heaven and earth. And you sit there with him and share, as a member of the body of Christ, in his authority, in his possessions. That's a wonderful thing. Now, why did he do that? Verse 7, that... The intent of it, in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness through, through, toward us through Christ Jesus. He did all of that because there's something out in the ages to come out there that he's going to demonstrate about his son through you. There's going to be a glorious revelation of his son and the fullness that he's put in his son when he exalts the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to participate in that. Now, that's quite a calling. That's a wonderful 
prospect and future that's been given to us. And that's what God's intention in creation is all about. When the Father created, sent His Son to create the universe, instructed Him to do that, He had a plan. Listen, in gen- when, when in God created the heaven and the earth, I talked to you the other night about God creating. There's only two possibilities. Either God created it or you created it. There's only two ways to make, have any change in life. You, are, you do it or God does it. If you're going to create, you know, that's what people do. You, you, you say, God didn't create things. That little thing Tom read last night was cute, wasn't it? It was profound, too. If God didn't do it, you're left up for you to do it. So you're going to be your own God, create your own world. You're going to be responsible for creating your own purpose and your own meaning and your own, your own happiness. And you know what? You already know you're a failure at it. You don't do it. So the other choice, that, that's life under the law, by the way. I'm going to perform. The other choice is God had a plan, and God did it. And God made the world, put Adam in the world. He, said, he didn't say, Adam, go out and create your world. He said, here, here's the world I created. You go out and enjoy it and eat of every tree except one, and that one is the one that determines what's right and wrong. That's my purview. Why? Because I created it. I know how it ought to work. Stay out of my, stay out of my garden. Stay out of what I'm, not my garden. Stay out of what I'm, my purview. And go out and enjoy this world I've given you. It's yours free to be used. And then he said, here, here's a companion. Because in that world you're living in, you need to live in a relationship. And it fascinates me that when people... Live in life. What you try to do is in your work and in the world, your possessions and the things you own and you accumulate and the things you do, you try to get your identity and you try to use your relationships. Carl talked to you about marriage. The most intimate relationship any, any two people have is the marriage relationship and over and over and over in marriage, what happens? One spouse is trying to use the other spouse to get their needs met. Now listen, I would never tell anybody they need to get married not to enjoy getting married and enjoy your spouse. Enjoy them serving you, loving you, and getting things. I, mar- I married my wife 45 years ago, and I've been enjoying being married ever since. <laughs> and she adds to my life. But I don't need her to give me meaning, purpose, acceptance, unconditional acceptance. She can't give me unconditional acceptance any more than I can. You understand that? You have all those met in Christ. So instead of using your spouse to get those things that only God can really give you, you have them met in Christ and now you're free to serve your spouse out of the possession you already have. I don't need to use my spouse to to get meaning and get significance and get value. I don't need my wife to do something to validate my existence. I have all of that in Christ. And if I needed my wife to do it, listen, she'll fail. And as soon as she fails because I was requiring it of her, you know what? Now I'm going to get mad at her because that's the law works wrath. And the forgiveness thing Steve was talking to you about, you get mad at him, what do you do? You begin to brood about it. I didn't get what I wanted. And you brood. And when you brood, you get bitter. And when that root of bitterness starts in your heart, that's why Hebrews 12 talks about, about Esau had that root of bitterness. And it could listen, you get a root of bitterness against someone down into your heart, it's like a dandelion. You never will get all the root out. But by the grace of God. And it poisons life. And a lot of people live in their marriage, in their relationship with their families, in their church life, in in life in general. And their life is nothing but a big garden of dandelion weeds with roots that they can't get out because they've let those, 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 those unrealistic expectations that they shouldn't have had to start with, that evil thinking, get, get down in there. Only the grace of God can take that out. Now, none of that's my message. That's all a commercial. I hadn't even started the thing here. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> I forgot. It's my party. I didn't. I forgot. 
I'm sorry. Okay. Now I got it started. That, that, that every, every, every bunch of minutes that was, it didn't matter. I'll go back to my message here now. But when he says there that in the ages to come, he's going to take that and put it on display. There's something important about that to understand. Now, I want to go over some things with you about it just, just doctrinally so we can get to the place where it's kind of, I can kind of make an application out of it. Go back with me to chapter number 1, if you will. Um, and uh, Ephesians 1, Proverbs chapter 3. And here's where I was going with that Genesis chapter 1 verse uh, 1 reference before I got sidetracked. In the beginning God created what? The heaven and the earth. But he didn't just step out on nothing and say, I think we need a heaven and an earth. Now you know that when he said heaven and earth, he could have said universe. He could have said, I created all things. He does that in John 1, Colossians 1. He says it that way. He said heaven and earth because there was a plan that he had that had to do with the heaven and the earth. Now, the earth is in the heavens. Okay? But the earth is a special planet in the universe with a special purpose that, there, that relates to everything else. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19. Passage I, I think is... This is one of those... I said the other night, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of preaching, a lot of sermons on Genesis 1 are a waste of time. Because they, take, they try to take Genesis 1 to prove things that Genesis 1 is not in the Bible to prove. Here's what it's there for. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath He established the heavens. By His knowledge the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. Notice... When God established the earth, He founded the earth, it was by His wisdom. When He established the heavens, when He put the heavens out there and put the ordinances of heavens and, 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 and the, the way things are going to work out there and the laws and the rules of heaven, He did it by understanding, by knowledge. God had wisdom, knowledge. He had a plan. He had the plan before He created it. So when He went there to create it, He literally had a blueprint. I want this, 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 for this reason, that reason, and the other reason. He didn't just willy-nilly think, I wonder what we should do today. So when He creates, there is a plan and a purpose behind His creation. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, because you find out something about that plan and purpose. Ephesians 1, verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of His will. Now, we appreciate the issue of the mystery. But here's the mystery of the Father's will that has been made known to us, kept secret until it's revealed through Paul, but now we know it. According to the good pleasure which He, which he purposed in Himself. The Godhead had a plan. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit sit down and they come up with this wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, this plan. They purpose in themselves. They plan this thing among the Godhead. And the whole plan had to do with that in the dispensation of the fullness of time. Now think about that. A dispensation is a particular set of instructions given for man's understanding and obedience. There is a dispensation that is called the dispensation of the fullness of times. The fullness of something is when it comes to its completion, when it comes to the fulfilling of its purpose. When something is, is brought to a full, now it's, func it's fully functioning. Can I say it that way? The fully functioning purpose of time. Now we were talking at lunch. There's the old Platonic idea that time and eternity are different. That comes from the philosophy derived from Plato. In the Bible, time and eternity are not different. Eternity is endless time. Time is the phenomenon. We live in four dimensions. 
the cube, the three dimensions of space, and the fourth dimension of time. Time is the phenomenal dimension in which you experience the cube, <laughs> the space. If you don't have time, you got, <laughs> and that's all. <laughs> Who said that? You? Now, I got two votes. You said that was wonderful, and he said my pig imitation was wonderful. <laughs> One more, and we're going to excommunicate this side of the crowd. <laughs> Find something better to be wonderful, will you? <laughs> the, the point is that time, when God created the universe, He created it to be experienced in time. So if you don't have time, you have... Eternity is not... Eternity is the ages to come. See, the ages to come, an age is a period of time, but it says ages, plural. So there's going to be a continuous, unending ages to come. That's the reason that word eon, in the, the Greek word eon, is translated forever and eternal. Because in Luke chapter 1, verse 32, he says he's going to have his kingdom for, for, uh, uh, for eternal. Well, let me read the verse. Luke chapter 1. Verse number 32, he shall, be great and shall be, he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Now that's the eon. And of his kingdom there shall be what? You know what forever means? No end. Don't let somebody come along and say, well, you know, an eon, an age comes to an end. Sure it does. But what he says in age, ages to come... He says, as soon as one's over, what's going to happen? Go get another one. Why? Because they're going to go on forever. That's eternity. Time never ending. One age after another age after another. Okay? That in the ages to come. So that in the dispensation of the foot, there's going to come a time when God's purpose for his creation that you experience in the phenomenon of time is going to have arrived. And that's what the dispensation of the fullness of time is. You don't need to get all bent out of shape about that and try to come up with some hallucination. Just the words tell you. It's when the purpose for time is brought to its, 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 its fulfillment, its, 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 its accomplishment. Why did God create time? He created it so you can experience creation. And when that purpose in creation is brought to pass, you've got a dispensation of the fullness of what in verse 10? Not time, but times. See, those ages aren't going to end. <laughs> and we'll talk about that, why that is in a few minutes. But I just want you to see that. That the dispensation, Ephesians 1, 10, of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. Even in him. Notice the things that he's going to gather together are what Genesis 1 talked about. Things in heaven and things on earth. Now, what are those things? Come with me to Colossians chapter 1. Ephesians and Colossians are, are sort of sister epistles. Colossians 1, verse 16. For by him were all things created. I've said a thousand times that verse was not written to put the monkey on the run. I don't believe in evolution. I don't teach evolution. I teach against evolution. But that's not what that verse is about. And when you make everything in the Bible about creation, about trying to de de debunk evolution, listen, when you try to make the Bible all about that, you lose all the purpose in creation. You have an ability to understand why he created. What did he create here? He tells you. That things that are in, earth, in heaven and they're in earth. So there's some things in heaven and some things in earth that he created. What are they? Visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. What are those? That's government. So you've got things in heaven and earth 
all the localities, visible and invisible, all kinds of, uh, of, 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 of creations, whether they be all kinds of dimensions, all kind, whether they be thrones, principalities, mites, that's the ranks of, of life. So God creates principalities, powers, thrones, dominions in heaven and in earth. Some you can see right here, you see them. Some you can't see, they're up there. Some occupied by creatures you can see, dudes like you and me. Some occupied by creatures you can't see, they live in a different dominion, the angelic creation. God created them all. Then why did he do that? All things were created by him and what? For him. They weren't created for you and me. They were created for Him. They were created to carry out His purpose and His will. He was before all things. That's why the plan is preexistent. And by Him, all things consist. It's His power that holds it all together. He set it up. He set it up ahead of time before He created it. And He created it accomplish His plan, His will, His purpose. Well, in the shorthand about what that is, come with me, if you will, back to, hold on to Colossians, Isaiah chapter number 40. And I know some of you have been around with us for years, and we talk about this a lot. Some of you this is all brand new about, and I hate to go through it so quickly. I'm trying to do it in a logical enough order you can follow it through. Because I'm, I am going somewhere. Isaiah 40, verse number 20, 21. God asked the nation Israel, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Have it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? And the answer to every question there is yes. They have known, they have heard, they have understood from the foundation of the earth. They knew some things about what was going on before Moses wrote Genesis 1, folks. Moses wrote Genesis 1 to some people who already knew about these things about creation. He didn't write Genesis 1 until after the Exodus. The nation's out there. Genesis 1 wasn't written the day of creation. <laughs> That's Moses writing about it. Verse 22, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. So what's the shape of the earth? Wow, isn't that an interesting thing? And the inhabitants thereof are like grasshoppers in his, uh, like grasshoppers. Back in verse 15, he says you, the, the nations are like a drop in the bucket. Verse 17, he says all the nations are as nothing. You know what? Compared to him, you don't amount to a whole lot. One of the greatest things I ever heard years ago, a guy said, you know, don't ever get worried about what people think about you, whether they know about you or they don't know about you. At any given time, 99.87% of the earth's population never heard your name. You know, there's about 5% of the population never know who the president is, no matter who he is. And you're worried about people. Do they know me? Don't know me? You walk in a room and say, is everybody looking at me? No, they're not looking at you. They're looking at themselves. What are they thinking about me? They're not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. They're doing the same thing you're doing. <laughs> that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out, now watch, as a tent to do what? When God created the universe, He created it as a stage in which He could manifest the glory of His presence. Now, God's God. You can't confine Him to one location. But because He is God, He can manifest Himself any place He chooses to manifest Himself. And He created a universe, stretched out like a tent, to dwell in. So when God brought Israel out of Egypt in Exodus 15, Israel, fully educated about what he was doing for them because they're his sons, they say, they sing that great song that we're going to go in, into the land, into the sanctuary where you intend to dwell and the Lord's going to reign. They knew at the beginning what the end was about. Now they get messed up in between, but they knew. So when God created all this, Jesus Christ creates everything. He creates it with a plan that has a goal to it. But it also has a structure. Now, we don't have time to go over all this stuff about the, the things in heaven and earth. Go back to Colossians with me. But I've tried to tell people for years, there are four things you can think about and get it. Number one, they're real. 
The government in the heaven and the government of the earth are real. The government in the heavens and the angelic realm is just as real as government on the earth. Why? He said so. Who would know better than the Creator? They are organized. Principalities, powers, dominion. It's not willy-nilly. There is an organized governmental structure that God created. That's why you go back in the book of Genesis, and one of the things He does is He creates order for man and society to function in. That's what nationalism, government, is all about, is to give order for the, for the uh, successful functioning of man. After the fall, it's for the protection of man's functioning. But listen, without sin, it's still, you still have the order. Out there in the future, in the kingdom, after Satan and sin is gone, you're still going to have the government, but you're not just going to have to say, listen, Ken, you do this, and if you don't, I'm going to whack you. Because Ken is a little rebel. He don't do things very often. Right. Correct. correct. He, he, said I'm be, he said I'm correct, that he doesn't do things right. But after the, said I, after the after the resurrect after the sin's gone, there won't be any more rebellion. But there still needs to be order and structure and decision making. So they're organized. But there's two other things you got to remember. He said he's going to gather together in one. If you gather something together, it implies it's been scattered. So the third thing you have to remember is that the, the, the creation of the government in heaven and earth has been usurped by an adversary. Isaiah 14, one of, the, one of the plans, original intention of Lucifer, when he quit being the light bearer for God's glory throughout his creation, he said, I'm gonna be, I will assault my throne, my throne, my government position, my position of rank and authority above the stars of God. I'm going to head over all the angels. And when he says, I'm going to be like the most high God. Satan is the great counterfeiter. He's a fraud. But his goal is to be like the Most High. That's a name in your Bible, Genesis 14, that describes God as the possessor of heaven and earth. You know who possesses all of the authority in the government of the heaven and the earth? Jesus Christ. Satan said, I'm going to take that job. And he went out and fomented a rebellion among the angelic creation. When man came on, he fomented a rebellion with man. In the Garden of Eden, Satan preached the greatest sermon ever been preached in the human history. He preached, he preached a sermon to half of the human race, converted his whole audience, and they went out and converted the rest of the human race. Did you get that? That's an effective message, but... No preacher since ever preached a message like that. And man joined the rebellion. And the authority has been usurped by the adversary, by his lie program. But when he says he's going to gather them back together, you know what that means? There's a reconciliation program God has. So they're real, they're organized, they're usurped, but God has a reconciliation restoration program for the heaven and for the earth. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. In all what things? The things in verse 16. The reason he formed the body of Christ is so he could be the head of all things in heaven and earth. Now, he didn't need the body of Christ to be the head of all things in the earth because he had who? Israel. He's going to restore Israel the authority of Jesus Christ over the government of the earth through the instrumentality of a kingdom vested in the nation of Israel. That's what prophecy is about. That which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness upon the face of the deep, and, God's, and everything's earth, 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 earth. He comes over here, takes some dirt, pushes it together, spits in it, makes a mud man out of it, and he's a man of the, he's a, he's a the earth, earthy. Because his purpose is to restore the authority of, of, of God's headship in the earth. It's not until you come to the ministry of the Apostle Paul, he says, I'm going to, as you've borne the earth image of the, uh, of the earthy, so shall you bear the image of the heavenly, because I'm going to put you in a position, create, a new, uh, create a one new man that's not just going to function down here in the natural world, you're going to function up there in that invisible world. And the reason he says... He formed the body of Christ 
He's the head of the body, the church, who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That, he's the firstborn from the dead, in the line of people going to be born from the dead just like him as members of the body of Christ in resurrection bodies, so that he can be the head of all things, not just the earth, but the heavens. Verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Listen, the Father thinks Jesus Christ is the cat's meow. Can I say it that way? <laughs> Prophet says he's the apple of my eye. He said he's the fullness of my joy. The Father thinks everything centers in his... That's why Ephesians 1, it says it's going to gather together in one, even in what? Him. He said it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. What things? People say, well, the devil lost people. That's not what it says. He tells you, by him I say, whether it be things in heaven, things in earth, or things in heaven. What would you read that? Verse 16. He reminds you in verse 20, we're still talking about the government. There's a reconciliation of the system that's real, organized, usurped, and now I'm gonna, he's going to reconcile it through the blood of his cross. Now, that's, what you're, that's where you're at in Ephesians 1 verse 10 when he talks about that in the dispensation, the fullness of time, he'll gather together in one all things in Christ. We're talking about him gathering together all of the whole system that he created and putting it back together, gathering it back together in one unit and doing it all in his son. Now, I want to say three things about that now that I've got my introduction. You need to understand there's a process by which this is accomplished. It's good to just say it. But there is a specific process, and this is what the Scripture is mostly about, about how that's going to be accomplished. So you need to understand, number one, the mechanics. Then you need to understand what it means. And then there's a measure that you need to understand about it. You see verse 10? That in the dispensation, the fullness of time, we might gather together in one all things, where? In Christ. He's going to gather them together in one all things. Now, New Bibles translate that all kind of different ways because they've got no idea what it's talking about. It's talking about being gathered together in one. What, what does it mean to be gathered together in one? You can take heaven and earth and gather them together in one. Well, come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's important to understand what this means. First Corinthians chapter 12. Verse number 27. Now you're the body of Christ and members in particular. You are the body. You are one body. And you are members in particular. Your one body has a whole bunch of parts to it. Right? Phalange, fingers and phalanges, what do you want to call them? You know. Hey, uh, you know, I walked out I walked out here a while ago. I don't, I don't know where I'm at. <laughs> Outside I walked under one of those one of those uh, stairways outside out here and in, in the outside one outside the building and see that thing on my head up here that my wife didn't do that uh i i walk i'm looking down and reading reading a uh thing about the picnic and i just walk right into a steel abutment <clears throat> my eyes go woo, 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 and my head goes ah you know i pull my hat off i'm worried about my hat did it get messed up <laughs> seeing the stars and finally you know i was one of those Sat by the car a minute and got my wits together, got in the car and drove on. Forgot about it until took till I got to the room, took my hat off. I saw that scrape place on my head. So my head hurt. And my eyes go, woo -doo, woo -doo, woo -doo. <laughs> Different parts. But my head's not all my body. My eyes not all my body. My leg hurts. You know. I asked Leon, first saw him, said, how you doing? He gave me an organ recital. Went up one side of his body and down the other. <laughs> He's got body parts that hurt, you know, this thing hurt. Parts is parts, you know. So you've got one body with a lot of parts. But how does your body function? It functions as 
one. All the parts working together under the control of the head. That's what 1 Corinthians 12 is about. So when you talk about being gathered together in one, it's like your body. Now, your body is the vehicle that manifests the life that's inside of it. First Corinthians, Ephesians 1 says, we are the church, which is His body. There are seven different metaphors in the book of Ephesians to describe what God's building today, and the most common one is the body. Because He put His life in us, and the function of the life in the body is to use the body to manifest the life inside of it. Your toe doesn't hang around just to be pleased by itself. Sometimes, you know, it, it, it aches and it gets a little attention. But the issue is to serve the body, the life in the body to manifest itself. You ever try to walk around without a big toe? You know, your big toe is important because if you don't have a big toe, it's very difficult to keep your balance. It serves a purpose, but it serves the body. So you've got this body with life to be manifest in it, but that body is made up of a whole bunch of parts. And it's made to work and function as one unit, one body, in order to manifest the life in it. Does that make sense to you? Who in there? Romans 12. Maybe that'll help. Romans 12. Romans 12. Verse number 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy, whether uh, uh, prophesy according to, the, uh, according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, and so on and so forth. In other words, we've got all these different members in the body, and what should we do? Everybody, every member of the body ought to do its job. My eye doesn't try to have to be my ear. My ear doesn't have to be my, my kidney. It needs to do its job. And if every member of the body works in unison under the direction of the head, it does one job. What does it do? It manifests the life that's in the body. When Paul says he's going to gather together in one all things, he's talking about the fact he's going to take all those things in the heavens, all those governmental positions in the heavens, all those governmental positions in the earth, and he's going to bring them together under the headship of Christ so that they function as one unit to manifest the life, the purpose, the plan of the head, the brains, the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that the head had when it created it. Now that's a wonderful thing to think about bringing that kind of harmony. Now, I don't have the time to go through a lot of details about that. Let me show you something about what that's talking about. Come with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Get Romans 1 in one hand and Isaiah chapter 11. This will just help us go a little faster, make me go faster. I'm sort of like Leroy was the other morning. He said he wanted that board so he could write it down and keep him on track. That's why I write notes and then I don't pay attention to them. <laughs> Romans chapter 1, verse 28. You know the passage, how men gave up. They didn't want to know God. They didn't have anything to do with God. They, did, they, did, they knew God. They didn't like retain. They, 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 uh, verse 21, because when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but, but became vain in their imagination, per, their foolish heart was darkened, professing. Themselves. We're going to do it our way. We know more than God does. We know more than mom and dad does. We know more than everybody. We're going to be our own God. We'll create our own world. What happened? They made a mess. It's what you do when you create it. You start off thinking you're real smart, and sooner or later you realize you, you, you screwed up. But the reason for that is professing themselves to be wise, they, became, they bought into a lie. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. You worship yourself. You're going to be your own God. Or somebody like you is going to be God. Make your decisions for you. You're going to put God's word aside. Worship and serve the creature. That's the lie, more than himself. Now, what you don't want God in your knowledge. So what did God do? Verse 28. 
even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God got mad, went up in heaven, sat on a big stool and pouted. Is that what it said? You know God's not up in heaven. I wonder what they're going to do next. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. He said, you don't want me? You think you know better? Have at it. Read the list of things that that follow after that that come from you trying to be your own God. Create your own world. Now what I want you to see in verse 28 is what they wanted to do. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. That's what Satan wants. He doesn't want you thinking about what God says. His, his goal is to eliminate thinking about God. Kill him off out of your mind. He, he knows you can't kill him. He knows you can't put him out of the universe. But he just wanted to, he just wanted to make sure that, that you don't think about him. You don't retain Him in your knowledge. You don't talk to your children about Him. When you have decisions to make in your life, you don't bring Him up. You put Him over here, maybe in a little box behind an altar, and go worship Him every now and then. But when it comes to life, you don't take His thinking into account. Does that sound like you? Then you're doing just what these people say. You know, I don't want that to sound like me. I wish I could stand here and say, oh, listen, I'm satisfied only with Jesus, but I know my heart better than that. And I know as much as I want that to be true, it isn't always true. Confession time. And I know I'm not any worse or better than you. That's the ploy. Just eliminate, he knows you can't get rid of, just don't think about him. Because if you don't think about him, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You're never going to walk by faith in in what God says. Now, God's response to that in in the prophetic program, come out Isaiah chapter 11. He's going to set up a kingdom and look what he's going to do in that kingdom. Isaiah 11, verse 9. We'll just just get one verse because we're in a hurry. I know you don't believe that, but we are. (laughs) They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. You know what he's going to do in the kingdom? He's he's going to take the nation Israel and through the nation Israel and the word of God going out from Jerusalem, he's going to fill up the whole earth with the knowledge of, that Romans says they, didn't, they weren't trying to eliminate. <laughs> He's going to manifest all that knowledge in every place. And they aren't going to get away with, uh, from it. Now in the kingdom, after the millennium, in the, in, in, in the dispensation full of time, they're not going to want to get away, away from it. <laughs> going to get over that. But it's His knowledge going to be manifest. That's what the kingdom program, that's what his purpose and plan in the nation Israel is all about. Now come with me to Ephesians 2. And I want you to know I just skipped about 20 minutes worth of talking about the mechanics of how that's going to accomplish, but you understand that. How he's going to establish the nation Israel. You see when he does that, by the way, I'll just describe it to you a minute. In order to to set up the kingdom, he has to do two things. It's pictured for you back in Numbers when he sends Israel into the land of of Canaan and says, go in and dispossess the nations and then possess it. First thing you have to do is you have to dismantle all of the pagan... He said, go in, all their pictures, all their idols, get rid of them, dismantle it. And then establish my worship, my knowledge. So when the, when, when the kingdom comes, Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to come and he's going to set up his kingdom. But first, there's going to be war. You remember this war in heaven? Then he comes down in flaming fire and there's war down here. And you know what you do when you have war? You break things and destroy things. And he's going to dismantle the course of this world that Satan set up. 
And by the way, that's reason, one reason there is a thousand years is to get rid of some of that stuff. And then he's going to establish his government in its place. Now, before he comes to the earth, there's that war in heaven, and it says there's no place found for the, Satan and his angels. And they're cast out. Do you remember that passage? We don't need to look at it, do we? Revelation chapter 12, verse number 9 through 12. Okay, if you need to write it down, look at it yourself. And at the end of that, he says, Now is come the kingdom of our God in heaven. Now the kingdom, now the reign, the government of God is established up there. And he said, Blessed are you that dwell in heaven. You know, when you dwell somewhere, you don't just live there. You don't just stay there. You're not dwelling in this hotel. You're visiting. Some of you are real glad you're visiting. But you're just visiting. When you dwell, you go where you live. And you come in and you kick your shoes off and you take your shirt off and, well, maybe not anything else, but <laughs> you relax and you feel at home. We're going to be dwelling in those heavens. And when we dwell up there, you know what it's going to do up there? Same thing he did with Israel down here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 7. That in the ages to come, he might show. That word show means to put on public display. Make showcases out of us. The glory that shall be revealed in us. You're literally going to be the, the vehicle through which that glory is manifested out into creation. Now, that's a, that's a fascinating, wonderful calling. We're going to put on display the exceeding riches of His kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. I think about that. Think about those two terms, the ages to come and the exceeding riches. You've got an age, and you show the superlative riches of, of His kindness. The age comes to an end, a new age comes. What's this age to show forth? The exceeding riches. Exceeding what? Exceeding what was revealed back there. Another age comes. I'm going to show forth the exceeding riches. Exceeding what? Exceeding what was there, which was exceeded the one that was before. You see how every age is going to produce a further advancement in the... Ma Listen... When you get to heaven, you're not going to get bored. Eternity is not going to be a boring kind of thing where it's all static. There's going to be a constant, exceeding revelation, demonstration, setting forth of all that God has put in His Son. Of the pleasure, the completeness, the fullness that He's put in His... He's the fullness of him that filleth all. You see, he said over there, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in him which is the head of all principality. Your completeness in Christ is in relationship to him being the head of all those things. And as the head of all those things, he's going to manifest the continued excellency of his son that gets to be so ex it, I used the illustration in our church when we were going through this stuff some time ago about eating a peach. Adam and Eve go out. Adam says, first day he's there, he says, well, have a good day, sugar. And he hits the road, and he goes out. And she goes out, and she says, you know, I don't know what I'm going to cook, going to fix for Adam for, for lunch, but he, I know he's worked hard out there all day. She goes out in the backyard, and she pulls, picks some peaches, and she comes in, and she has sliced peaches on the table when Adam comes in. And he says, what's for supper? And she says, oh, I got some of these peaches. And he eats those sliced peaches, and he says, babe, this is wonderful. You are Primo, you're the only girl in the world for me. I don't know how you take care of me so good. Next morning, Adam hits the road. He goes out and Eve says, you know, I just love him so much. I want to do something extra special for him. He loved those peaches so much. And you know, I noticed over there that this stuff, I bet I could make some flour out of that. Some sugar, I'm sorry, some sugar out of it. Something sweet. And so she makes some sugar, grinds up some sugar cane, makes some sugar. 
And she puts them on the peaches. Have you ever had sliced peaches which have been put in sugar? Now, look, sliced peaches ain't nothing to smoke. There's nothing wrong with sliced peaches. They're good. But sliced peaches been sugared up real well. They're gooder. Okay? It's no slight on the sliced peaches. It's just to say, here's something that exceeds it. Because I've discovered some wisdom and knowledge that let me enhance it. You follow that? Next day he goes out. Um, that night he comes in and he is, man, he is so impressed with Eve. How could she have been so wonderful? Next day she goes out. And that day she finds some more ingredients. She sees the cow out there and she says, you know, that cow, wonder what, what is that? I bet that'd go with those peaches. And by the way, and she, she makes a peach cobbler. Mm. She got a little milk. She turns that up, make a little cream, peach cobbler and cream. And now you can see where that would go, can't you? Now, Sliced peaches are good. Sugared up sliced peaches are gooder. But man, have you had peach cobbler with a little cream on it? Oh! Can you, can you take that simple flawed illustration and understand there's an age and there's something, you, 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 you come to appreciate something about the, the excellency of the Lord Jesus Christ? And then there's another age that comes along and by further examination of who he is, you see the exceeding riches. And every age is going to be an exceeding manifestation of who he is and of who you already are in him. Isn't that wonderful? It isn't going to be boring. It's going to be exciting. This is what's going to happen after all the sin is all gone, all the rebellion is gone, and it's just because the Father wants all fullness to dwell in His Son. He wants it to be in Him that everything flows. He wants us to be able to know and appreciate all of the joy that he finds, all the pleasure he finds, all the excellency he finds in his son. Because nothing thrills the father more than his son. And eternity, he created it all just so that his son could be discovered, as it were, in all of that. That's the meaning of it. The mechanics is what prophecy and mystery is about. Israel and the body, heaven and earth. But there's a measure of that. Because, folks, your appreciation of anything is based upon your ability to appreciate it. That's why he talks in Ephesians 4 about the measure of every part. Your, listen to me, your edification and sound doctrine right now. What I mean by that? First, you have to learn, when he talks about in 1 Timothy 1 about godly edifying, which is in faith. Edifying your inner man based upon what God's doing. You develop a capacity within your inner man to understand and appreciate doctrine, truth, what God's doing. Who Jesus Christ is. You do that through two things. One, you do it through the intake, of, uh, the intake of the information. If you don't get in God's Word rightly divided and understand what God's Word rightly divided teaches you, if you don't go through Paul's epistles, listen, there is a design for your, your perfecting. Romans 16, 25 and 26. That's laid out in Paul's epistles. You don't have to know about it. You just read Paul's epistles. This brother back here is telling me he's just studying Paul's epistles and he, and he goes and talks to another brother and he says, if, if, if I just knew the doctrinal order, if there's some doctrinal order to this stuff, and the guy says, there is, <laughs> and change your life, right? Why? Because the doctrinal order was already there and he was already discovering it. And if you just go through Paul's epistles, they'll edify you. And every time you go through, you... you but what you're doing is you're, you're building up that, sound, that form of sound words. That's why it can't be denominationalism. That's why it can't just be willy-nilly. That's why rightly dividing, following, the pattern, following that pattern of sound words is, is critical. 
And as you do that, you build an understanding in your inner man. And then there has to be the proper response of faith to that. Because knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. It isn't enough just to know it. It's to have it transform your thinking, your life. The renewed your mind, transform your life. That's why Romans 5 says, Tribulation works. Trouble works patience. Patience is, I'm going to stick, here's what the word says, I'll stick by it. Trouble, when the CNS gang comes, the circumstances and situations of life come in, and they, they gang up on you. You can drive by, shoot you, mug you. And you go, oh! You going to stick with the truth or you're not? You going to stick with who you are in Christ? You're going to run off. You going to stay with what God says? You're going to go off in hallucination. When you stay with what God says, patience works experience. Experience is skill in handling problems. And experience works, work, uh, works hope. Without hope, you never get out of anything. You know what that is? That's, we don't just have the doctrine, but that doctrine works in our functional life to create his, his, his thinking. Now, as you do that, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ, what's going to be judged and determined is your capacity for service. Based upon your edification in sound doctrine, and again, not just head knowledge, Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. Charity is the ability to think, value, and esteem a thing the way God does. It's, we heard the message already. Love, serving one another by love. By love, serving one another. Okay? That's the truth. Functioning. Motivating us. Working. You know what that is? That's me really understanding it. And just living in the reality of it. And I've learned the truth, and I've learned how to apply it, and I've learned how to look at life and make decisions that renewing my mind is I'm beginning to be able to think about this circumstance the way God thinks about it, and the mind of Christ becomes a reality in my experience. Now, the capacity that you develop right now in your life, this is why you don't want to fire all of your workers. If tribulation works patience, if this light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us, don't fire all your workers. Don't try to run away from your problems. There are contexts in which you can learn the doctrine. In you, can, you learn the doctrine out of the book. You can apply the doctrine by faith. And you learn how to become skillful. You learn experience. Am I making sense to you? What you do at the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10, will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and every man will receive the things done in his body, whether it's good or bad. What did you do in your body? Not what your body did, but what you did in your body, the life in you. What did your inner man, what kind of edification and renewing did your inner man have? What kind of capacity does your inner man really have to serve and walk in the mind of Christ? Because he's going to take you out of that little, that little carcass you live in now, that vile body that Brother Steve's talking about this morning and kind of demonstrating for us, and put you into a glorious body fashioned like his body. You know what his body did when it was glorified? It shone as the sun. Not a reflected light, but light. The glory is in it, shone out. You know what you're going to do in eternity? You're going to... Show. But the capacity that you have to, the wattage that you have to shine with, <laughs> is a relative thing based upon the capacity you've developed now. I'm trying to use an illustration to say that. You follow that? That's critical to understand. And I'm saying that so you understand, you have this wonderful completeness. You have access to everything God thinks about His Son. It's yours. You don't have to do anything to gain it. But the level to which you come to appreciate it 
that measure of every part is what life right now is really about. You see, life right now really isn't about you creating your own world and you creating your own success. Listen, ladies, you don't have to be a successful mother to validate your existence. Your existence is validated by who you are in Jesus Christ or not at all. Mister, you don't have to accumulate mountains of things to be worthy because your worth comes from who God made you in His Son. See, we go out and try to create it. It's, we try to create with our education, our looks, our, our skills, our resources, our relations. We, we, use all, we, we try to be God. And God says, I gave it all to you. It's like I gave it to Adam. And I gave it to you in Christ. And you can freely partake. But if you just go out and get sliced peaches and you never think about putting sugar on them, you're just going to eat sliced peaches. Now that ain't bad. Okay? But it's not as good as it could have been. It's not going to be unworthy. But there's more. You follow that? Back in Solomon's day, the Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon. She said, I've been hearing all these tales about you, 1 Kings 10. I've been hearing all these tales about how about the glory of your, your ascent. Solomon's throne, there was a golden ascent that went up to Solomon, had his a throne made out of ivory sitting on a golden staircase. She said, I've heard all this stuff. And I said, that can't be true. She came and she saw it. And she said, and we have a song. that we used to, I, When I was a kid, we used to sing it. Young, when I was young, we used to sing it. Some of the old timers remember it. I shouldn't say that. Some of you older saints will remember it. Old timers might really know it. She said, the, I, I've seen it with my, and the half has not been told. She said, I thought it was an exaggeration, and it wasn't, they didn't even tell it half good enough when I see the real thing. I just got to, I had just come see it for myself. I'm glad to know that one day I'm going to get to see it for myself because I can't tell you the half of it. You and I are going to get the privilege of living the grace life together throughout the ages to come. You also have the privilege to start living that life right now. I pray that be your reality. That you would live right now in that ever growing up in Him, ever increasing your capacity, your skill, at taking His Word, understanding His Word, and then seeing it work in you effectually because you believe it. And bringing every thought, every action, every part of your life, your business life, your home life, your family life, your school life, your recreational life, bring it all into captivity to what? The obedience of Christ. To what He has accomplished and who He's made you in Himself. A glorious revelation of all that Jesus Christ is 
through the church, the body of Christ, at that exaltation. That's the goal of God's grace. What a prospect, child of glory, that the future hold in store. By the wildest flights of fancy, thou couldst never ask for more. Heir of God, joint heir forever with his own beloved son. God, to you could not have promised more bliss than he's done. If you're in here tonight and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never chosen to just rely on him, you're trusting a prayer you prayed, a preacher's hand you shook, a, sacrifice, a sacrament you took, an ordinance you, you, that, that you obeyed, some kind of thing you quit doing. The mayor of New York City, that, that, that when he got unelected Bloomberg, he said, I don't worry about heaven because if anybody deserves to go to heaven, it's me. I'm just going to walk right on past Peter at the pearly gates. If you realize that isn't going to be you, can I, can I commend my Savior to you? You young people, I trusted Christ when I was 15 years old. That's 51 years ago, this December. I've never regretted it one day of my life. When I got saved as a young man, I took it serious immediately. Six months after I got saved, I'd read, read Paul's epistles through three dozen times. I just wanted to know what God said. I didn't care what anybody else said. I just wanted to know what God said. It got me kicked out of a Sunday school class and a couple of other places. It was okay. It was good for me. Can I tell you that as a, as a junior high and high school and college student, I wouldn't take those days for a minute not having been in Christ and taking him serious. You want to have a life that lays before you? That's a, you're going to live in a world that is going to be so different than what your parents lived in, they don't even know how to prepare you for it. But you can gain some skill about how to live as a member of the body of Christ, no matter what your circumstances are, and you'll be prepared for it. And I tell you that because that's the reality of life in Christ Jesus, and that's the wonderful challenge. It thrills me to see young people interested in it. It thrills me to see folks that are older who stick with it. <laughs> Some of you have stuck with it for years of confusion and disappointment and not knowing what was going on. And now you begin to say, whoa, look at what the reality is. <laughs> and you say, boy, I wish I had those years. Listen, don't worry about what's back there. Look at look what's the future. You've still got opportunity. <laughs> To grow. Some of you have been at it a long time. Some of you just start. Listen, this is something that's real. This is life. As you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. It doesn't change when you get saved as to the way it works. It's still all about him. It's all in him. That's the deal. So grow up in him. That's what studying the Scripture is about. But it's not just learning a bunch of verses. It's letting them change you. Because that renewed mind, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You take in that, the, the Scripture and then you believe it. You say, this is the way I'm going to start thinking. And you gain skills. You gain godliness. And it has the promise of the life that now is. Your life now will be the best it could be and of that which is to come. Father, we thank you tonight for our Savior in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, we'll stand.